Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please uh, take your seats and uh, very warmly welcome to this afternoon session. I hope you all had a bit of lunch and uh, are ready for new knowledge, new inspiration, and uh, to discuss with us uh, some new aspects, in, in the, mainly in the field of anti-doping. My name is Jesper Frigas Larsen. I'm uh, on a daily basis, the legal manager of Anti-Doping Denmark. I've been involved in anti-doping for the past uh, 25 years, being the prosecutor of uh, doping cases in, in Denmark, and uh, thus uh, being part of what you could call the uh, anti-doping establishment, working together with other NATOs, with WADA, with the NATO, and so on. And uh, sometimes I think every kind of establishment needs to be challenged a little bit in our usual ways of thinking and uh, some of those who are maybe best placed to challenge us are uh, various uh, scholars and academics uh, in uh, academic institutions around the world and also of course uh, journalists etc who uh, maybe can see some uh, fresh and new angles on some of the work that we do on a daily basis hopefully leading to uh, inspiration for us who uh, work full-time in, in the field of anti-doping to improve our product, our product obviously being protecting uh, the clean athletes against uh, those who try to cheat their way to medals. And uh, regarding the fact that uh, the IOC's Oswald report has just been published today, uh, the, I think uh, this, of course, uh, is a product protecting the clean athletes that uh, seems more important than ever before. But to lead us into this uh, hopefully fruitful uh, discussion will be uh, Benjamin Bendrich, uh, who will take a little bit more general approach to the athletes' rights. What we have uh, thematically here this afternoon is the athletes' rights in uh, respect of the anti-doping system that they are all part of. Ben is from uh, the University of Göttingen. He's working with politics and uh, sports since a number of years. He's also a very, very good basketball player. I think he would challenge everybody in one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. uh, but uh, here he will uh, speak about uh, athletes' rights uh, in more general, and then we'll be more specific later on about athletes' rights in anti-doping. Please, Ben. Yes, I want to welcome you all to my presentation. My name is Benjamin Bendrick, and I'm, I'm going to talk about extended athletes' rights, a necessary power shift in elite sports. First of all, I want to give you a short outline. Uh, I want to talk about the current situation in elite sports, then about, uh, first of all, about the sports organizations, the athletes, then the Rule 40 as a symbol of, extreme, of an extreme legal system, some general information about it, then a comparison between superstars and the regular Olympic participant, the consequences for athletes and non-Olympic sponsors, and then some structural changes, how to extend athletes' rights, and in the end, of obviously, a conclusion. Uh, global elite sports is currently going through its worst crisis of its history, but the current situation can also be seen as an opportunity for organizations to renew themselves, or to renew them from the outside. To, res to restore trust in sports federation, changes are necessary to prevent continued exploitation of athletes, corruption, fraud, doping, to finally make federations more transparent. How is such a change possible? Although there is a massive injection of capital into sports and a noticeable professionalization, many of the expected benefits, like wage increases, unionizations, workers, uh, protection, health precautions, and investment into uh, education are still often missing. To some extent, similar situations can be found in the Olympic, non-Olympic, Paralympic movements, as well as in US college sports, the NCAA. In all of these cases, the weakest component is still the athlete. Sports organizations and federations are powerful entities and are often independent from national regulation and government control. They are the lone governing bodies. They, have, uh, they write the rules, they decide on the athlete's fate, on their suspension, financial support, and on their sponsorship deals. 
They have a clear monopoly. Over the years, they have built a monocracy. If we have a look at the money distribution on the right, it becomes obvious that especially federations and their officials profit. Especially on the national level, the cash flow is hard to track. 206 National Olympic Committees and 35 international federations get about $520 million each every year. The USOC, for example, pays its CEO $1 million. 14 other executives more than $200,000 and 121 executives more than $100,000. The average track and field athlete on, in the United States only uh, earns about $17,000 a year. In Germany, it's far less. It becomes obvious that the athletes are not at the forefront of the policies. The structures in sport are not athlete-centric. There is nothing inherently wrong with an IOC or a federation making a huge amount of money, but there's something troubling about a sport enterprise where the athlete is not paid at all. At the bottom of the Olympic movement are the hardworking semi-professional athletes who only re receive the last crumbs of the pie. An athlete has to choose either uh, either abiding by the rules of the NOCs and the IOC or having their fundamental rights upheld. Until today, the athlete has chosen to go with the sport, although some of these rules clearly restrict and violate their human rights. Rule 40 is a typical example. It is the most important tool to retain and control the revenue flow. Rule 40 is designed to protect the rights of Olympic exclusive partners by limiting what athletes and non-Olympic partners can do and say. The general principle of Rule 40 is prevent the impression of a commercial enterprise between non-Olympic partners and the Olympic enterprise. Only official sponsors are allowed to use official trademarks and trademarked Olympic terms, phrases, images in their advertising. For companies, companies that are not official Olympic partners, for example, terms and phrases like Olympic gold medalist, Rio gold, and games are banned. If we look to the United States, more than 200 trademarks can be found on the US electronic trademark search. If you have a look at the official document on the right, the justification for Rule 30, uh, 40 excuse me, by the IOC is at least I would call interesting. It is supposed to prevent over-commercialism and wants the focus to remain on the athlete's performance. During the so-called blackout period, or frozen period, as we call it in Germany, it's, all, it's about a month long. It starts nine days before the opening ceremony. It prohibits non-Olympic sponsors, some of which athletes have sponsored their athletes for years, and also the game, doing the games, to communicate with their athletes in any way. It doesn't matter if digital or print. Also, the athletes cannot thank their sponsors as well. Many German athletes are enraged that also the update of the four, Rule 40 restricts business opportunities of athletes. The update allows non-Olympic sponsors to create, an, to create an ad campaign, but it has to be approved and, um, and reviewed by the IOC and the NOC six months prior to the games. Most of the athletes are not even nominated during that time, but it also dis dictates even stricter limitations during the blackout period. You can see it on the chart on the right. Non-Olympic partners are not allowed to share, repost, or retweet any content of the Olympic movement. That includes any information from the IOC, NOCs, from uh, the athletes themselves, the coaches, um, the officials, and you are also not allowed to mention any kind of results or accomplishments. So non-Olympic partners or sponsors actually have to pretend like the Olympic, uh, Olympic Games are not taking place at all. On the left side, actually, you see a violation of the Rule 40. It's an example from the German Olympic Committee. You can see, um, yeah, on the swimming trunks, there's a very small, uh, the Olympic rings, you can see that's a violation. And then the athlete is named Olympic diver. That's an another violation. The consequences for the, for the athletes. For the superstars like Michael Phelps and Under Armour as his sponsor, there are no really 
big deal. It's not a big deal because they still can make a commercial and everybody can connect the dots. It's very easy. But for athletes like Son Rui Yang on the right, a marathon runner from Singapore who is not in the public eye every day, the difference is huge. Many spectators are not able to connect the dots in the same way. Mentioning the Olympics or an international event would give him direct public exposure and equity. If often local and private sponsors don't, any, don't see any kind of return, it will be difficult for athletes to find sponsors. You can get the impression that the Rule 40 is an insurmountable barrier that was erected by design to keep athletes indentured. So, how can athletes' rights be achieved? Nearly all of the legal documents impose unfair obligations on the athletes. None of these documents guarantee their fundamental human rights. So on the one hand, a declaration of athletes' rights would give the International Sports Federation a clear image boost. On the other hand, such a declaration would uh, secure human rights for the athlete, and wh where they are violated, athletes can access legal assistance. Secondly, athletes are involved all in, in all levels of sports worldwide. They know the system inside out. They have a large interest in good governance and dialogue. Until today, most committees and councils or boards, both nationally and internationally, have a small number, sometimes only one single athlete, like in Germany, representing the athlete's interest. Therefore, these athletes don't have enough voting power to influence any decisions. Zicke Kastner described the problems on Sunday. Athletes should have the power to influence elections and removals of council members. Also, they should get a fair share of the marketing rights. It's not fair that the IOC or the NCAA in the United States have all the marketing rights of the athletes. They should be split up between, for example, local sponsors and international sponsors, or a one-on-one -on -one model. Also, fourthly, there are many governing bodies abusing their power, their position by creating rules and bylaws, thereby restrict business opportunities of athletes. The EU will, for, uh, will um, strike down the Federation's power to forbid athletes from taking a part in private or um, business uh, events, uh, like in the ISU case, and also the, the German Federal Cartel Office will probably bring changes to the Rule 40. The most powerful option for athletes is the establishment of un unions. Unions in each individual sport on a national level are not unrealistic anymore. On a national level, employees are protected by employment and labor law. They have the right to organize and collectively bargain. Sports organizations, on the other hand, are cartels subject to competition and antitrust laws, like we heard yesterday. It might give the athlete the much needed power to put a lid on the official's power and control. Germany's Athletes Commission has launched a Verein, a club, to represent the interests of the German athletes. But most importantly, it will hopefully establish to take an objective, to have an own voice or view. To this, to this day, the, chap, the charter of the Athletes Commission in Germany, of the German Olympic Committee, says that the commission's role is to advise the executives of the DOSB, of the German uh, National Olympic Committee. The, mo the move was long overdue and was a necessary step in the right direction. The new Verein will, survive, uh, support, sorry, will support athletes regarding legal matters, financial support, dual career, and other conflicts. Hopefully, this is just a start and one day different unions will arise. Officials have to make concessions regarding the athlete's influence. If they don't, they may lose their unique position via court rulings. To have a checks and balances, athletes should either get a fair share of the seats in all the committees, boards or councils, or should be able to name representatives, spokesmen for these positions. A 50-50 quota would revolutionize the system. Athletes would be able to monitor the action of the federations and would have the chance for debate calling decisions also their own. Thank you very much.
This is not on. Yes, thank you, Ben. Uh, we'll come back to questions and answers a little bit later. Just uh, a reminder that one of the reasons, of course, for Rule 40 is that uh, the Olympic Games have a clean venue policy, which means that there are no advertisements in the stadiums whatsoever. And uh, the IOC, in order to achieve a lot of sponsorship money, have only the possibility to give these sponsors the rights to use the Olympic rings and the Olympic wordings. Uh, and uh, to make this an, an, an attractive deal for the sponsors, uh, this, these rights are given in uh, exclusivity so that nobody else can use them. And, uh, and so these uh, sponsors are the only one, those who pay to the IOC, who, they, who can then use uh, the Olympic rings in their own commercials, their own advertisements, outside of the field of play, outside of the stadiums, but in, in connection with the Olympic Games. And there is uh, one of the dilemmas that we may discuss a little bit later on. Anyway, now we're moving to the uh, more doping-oriented uh, interventions. And uh, the first one is uh, Daniel west uh from the University of Münster, not very far away here, who will uh, speak to us about his uh, uh, subject of the impact of price money on doping behavior. Please, Dan. Thank you very much, uh, much. It's a pleasure for me to talk here because uh, four years ago I was still a master's student and uh, I presented uh, the agent-based uh, concept on doping uh, at the Play the Game uh, in uh, Aarhus four years ago. So since then we did a, yeah, we put a huge amount of effort into our uh, simulation model and I'm really happy to uh, present you some of uh, the, uh, the results because in a further analysis we focused on different um, anti-doping measures and we yeah, are able now to um, calculate the efficiency of these different um, anti-doping measures like test frequency, uh, test frequency uh, the amount of price money, um, the uh, fines, bans and so on. In this talk I would like to focus just on the price money and the price money uh, distribution. So if we have a look at the um, yeah, winner's prize money at major events, we can see that there is, in some cases, are huge amounts of prize money to win. For example, the winner of uh, the Wimbledon tennis tournament uh, will receive 2.2 million uh, pounds, or the winner of the Tour de France uh, gets uh, 500,000 uh, euros for his uh, win. So according to the superstar effect, you can see that the, yeah, minor differences in performance um, can lead to large income differences. And what we can see is that um, yeah, the fight against doping mainly focuses uh, on uh, deterrence, so on testing, on punishment, uh, and so on. And so far, there are just yeah, insufficient findings regarding uh, the impact of price money on doping behavior. So our key question is, how does the amount of price money and its distribution impact the doping behavior of top athletes? Yeah, to give some policy recommendations, um, years ago, um, some game theoretical um, yeah, um, models were developed. One of the oldest ones is the, um, uh, was made by Breivik in 1987. It is uh, based on the prisoner's dilemma. And uh, in the further um, uh, following years, some models focus on fines, bans, price money, whistleblowing, and so on. But um, game theoretical models have a big issue because um, if they are um, yeah, development, uh, developed uh, in a too complex way, they can't be solved analytically anymore. So we saw a huge uh, need for a computer-based uh, model to solve uh, this problem. So this is why we developed an agent-based uh, computer model that incorporates elements of human and social uh, behavior. And because of this, it is applied in very many um, social sciences. And so it's uh, used uh, to uh, simulate, for example, tax uh, evasion. So during the simulation, a uh, system, uh, system behavior um, evolves that is not um, depict, uh, depictable from the individual, ind individual uh, behaviors. Uh, so you have some kind of an emergence. 
So some researchers say that um, yeah, agent-based modeling has the potential to become a third way uh, of doing science besides argumentation and formalization. And because, um, um, yeah, and um, there are some critics that say, okay, it's just some kind of a computer game, but no, it's not, it's no magic, it's no game, it's just math. So there's a lot of um, formulas uh, behind our um, simulation model. I don't uh, want to uh, bother you with uh, pages of, um, of uh, formulas, so I just uh, use this uh, slide to yeah, explain you um, the uh, agent-based model. So um, we have uh, three kind of uh, objectives. We have an anti-doping agency that announces the um, anti-doping rules and reports uh, the um, anti-doping uh, statistics. We have an anti-doping laboratory that conducts the controls. And we have a population of heterogeneous um, athletes, for example, per, um, cyclists. And um, the athletes, the group of athletes is uh, um, distinguished in four types of athletes. So we have rational athletes that may uh, use doping with respect to an ex um, expected utility maximization approach. We have suggestible uh, athletes that are strongly influenced by their social network, like um, a national team or their training group. We have moral athletes that uh, just act compliant to the rules. And we have so-called erratic um, athletes that may um, use uh, doping unintentionally, unintentionally because, uh, yeah, of, because of a lack um, of um, doping knowledge. So yeah, now I would like to move uh, over to the results or the, uh, the basic results. As you can see here on the black uh, line um, represents the uh, simulated uh, doping prevalence rate. And as you can see, it fits to the, um, yeah, to the estimated prevalence uh, rate that was published by Oliver de Hond in his uh, review. So we have some kind of a realistic uh, doping prevalence rate in our model. The red um, uh, line um, represents the uh, doping rate issued, um, or the, of the, the doping ro rate in um, the um, simulation model, and it lingers at about 1%, and this also fits perfect uh, to the real statistics uh, on doping that are published annually uh, by the World uh, Anti-Doping Agency. So, yeah, and the next step, um, we uh, used different uh, price money distributions. One uh, was um, yeah, taken from the uh, PGA Tour, one uh, was taken from the uh, Tour de France, and we um, yeah, developed two um, artificial price money distribution uh, in just using linear price money distributions. Then we ran a huge amount of different simulation scenarios. So it took yeah, days, I think, uh, just to run the computer simulations. And in the last step, we could uh, yeah, conduct a sensitivity analysis to measure the impact of the um, price money distributions and amounts of uh, price money. So the, you, right here, you can see the considered uh, price money distributions. So, for example, the winner of the PGA Tour wins or gets a 10% uh, of the whole amount of uh, prize money. In contrast to, that, to this, um, the winner of the Tour de France wins more than half uh, of the price, uh, total prize money. So there's a huge uh, gap between um, the, the uh, ranks, and uh, this is yeah, explained by the superstar effect I mentioned before. Um, yeah, and, and because of this, we, as I mentioned, uh, we yeah, developed two um, linear artificial um, price money distributions just to make some comparison. So right here, for example, you can see um, the um, results for the PGA Tour. We use different amounts from one token to 10 million tokens, and you can see here that uh, yeah, the uh, amount of price money has an influence uh, of the, um, of the uh, doping behavior as it differs from 25% um, to 35%. Right here, you can see uh, the results for the Tour de France, which is uh, 
a bit um, different. As you can see, that the uh, um, doping uh, prevalence rate is a bit lower, but uh, the um, different results are more fuzzy. So you can see that the um, yeah, um, amount of prize money doesn't have such a big uh, impact on uh, doping behavior if you use uh, this kind of uh, prize money distribution. But here you can see the uh, results uh, from uh, the linear top uh, 20 um, um, uh, simulation um, um, a scenario. Um, also here it's come kind of fuzzy, um, like um, if you look at the uh, linear top 100. So um, um, this is just uh, to give you some background information because um, the most important uh, slide I would like to share with you uh, is the sensitivity analysis. And right here you can see uh, the impact uh, of uh, different price money um, distributions uh, in one slide. Because uh, on the, um, the y-axis you can see the uh, share of uh, doped um, athletes. And uh, on the x-axis, you can see uh, different amounts uh, of price money used. And um, what was really interesting is that uh, the doping rate varies uh, between 25% and 33% uh, depending on the uh, underlying price money uh, distribution. What you can uh, also see is that the amount of uh, price money just has a little impact uh, on the uh, doping rate. So uh, this could also uh, explain uh, doping in uh, recreational uh, sports as well. And uh, another result is that the uh, price money function um, um, uh, the price money functions with uh, cons uh, consistently large uh, slope leads to uh, more uh, doping, while uh, linear price money functions with a more flat uh, slope leads uh, to the lowest um, doping rate. So based on our results, we would like to give some uh, policy recommendations for um, federations and uh, organizers of uh, mega events. So the price money um, distribution should uh, be yeah, more, um, uh, the price money should um, distribute it more uh, evenly among uh, all athletes because uh, yes, yeah, so you can uh, see for the uh, Tour de France case, there are huge uh, differences um, in the uh, price money distribution. And uh, this is, these are some kind of uh, yeah, recommendations that are easy to uh, implement because um, just the amount, uh, the amount of price money don't have to be adjusted. You just have to reallocate the price uh, money. And uh, yeah, so this is a, some kind of um, anti-doping measure that is uh, free uh, of charge. You can use uh, our uh, simulation model now for um, yeah, intelligent uh, testing because you could uh, analyze new anti-doping uh, concepts uh, before you launch them. So computer, our computer simulation model is some kind of uh, powerful and um, cost uh, efficient. So yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. One thing we may come back to, to you is uh, the fact that when you compare PGA Tour, where each player is an individual player, on his own uh, with the Tour de France where the price money is actually just a small amount on top of the major distribution of the money that's available which is based on the salaries of the of the teams where the big stars have already got a huge salary uh, and uh, uh, there's a I think a principal uh, a difference um, which you may uh, reflect on uh, later on in the question and answer session anyway Back to uh, the list of speakers, and uh, the next is uh, a double headline act, I think they would say in the concert uh, business, uh, because we have uh, two speakers, Marcel Schaff and, uh, from the German Sports University in Köln, and uh, Nils Zurowski from the University of Hamburg, and they are looking into uh, the ADAMS system. Now, what is the ADAMS system? It's the WADA's World Anti-Doping Agency's database for athletes where all data concerning athletes uh, are registered. Uh, do doping tests, doping uh, TUEs, everything. 
And uh, the challenge for the athletes uh, privacy when having to deal with such a database is what you will uh, look into. So please, Marcel first, I believe, and then Niels. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, what means privacy in a seemingly totally surveilled world? For athletes, privacy does not seem to take place in a system of apparent total surveillance through the doping control system. So, Nils Sarovsky and me want to give you a short insight of our five self finance research project how athletes' assessment and knowledge of the atoms is, and if privacy could happen in a doping control system. So we want to give you a short insight about what kind of consequences the atoms triggered and how we could analyze and describe the effects of the atoms into the privacy of athletes. Through selected results, you should get an overview of the athlete's perspective and to get a better understanding how they feel in the system and how they describe it. So what are the unintended consequences of that foreign regulated local based service system? That assistance system for managing and planning doping controls. So the ADAMS is a kind of a social sorting regulator through the test pools, control frequencies, long-term profiles, blood passports, and the provided whereabouts by the athletes. So the athletes are part of the system. They provide they, their own survived life. From a social perspective, it is a system that forces diversity and discrimination. And through the atoms, there's an intrusion and an infringement into privacy from a legislative perspective. We're not speaking from the doping controls system perspective. So the atoms creates manageable data subjects where athletes are no more than glassy subjects for the doping control system. So the ADAMS supports the doping control system to make athletes handleable, manageable. In dependency on realized web surveys and qualitative interviews that we did between 2012 and 2015 with over 28 athletes, journalists, politicians, and lawyers, we developed a web survey in a three-time pretest period. And the survey period between July and October last year, 2016, athletes of the registered testing pool and the national testing pool had the chance to participate at the anonymous survey. The access they got through a personalized email with a unique login. The National Anti-Doping Authority in Germany helped us to send the email logins to the athletes. So what we can say, around about 25 of the 2,152 athletes participate at the web survey. So statistically, we found normally distributed values. And the most athletes in Germany are part of the national testing pool and the ATP, so Allgemeiner testing pool, and the team testing pool and only around about 500 athletes in Germany are part of the highest. So where all athletes in this testing pool are arrested each day for one hour at home. Along four categories, we ask the athletes about their knowledge, assessment, and opinion of the ADAMS and the related doping controls. ADAMS function is besides collecting the whereabouts, planning and managing doping controls to extend the values of sports, kind of a value reminder the Adams is. The system wants to prevent the athletes from doping. Most athletes accept the Adams, accept the doping controls, and 
it's for them part of athletes being and part of sports. What we can say about the usability, it's one of the most effective things what we could see, because time is for athletes fundamental in their training full life. They need every minute to organize and realize the training and the time for the competition. Therefore, the atoms must be quick and easy to handle. But the athletes are disturbed by that system because it isn't that self-explanatory and easy to classify from the athlete's perspective. Particularly if you have to change very often training locations or for private reasons. And especially for the private reasons, there are a lot of, uh, they, they feel it really disturbed by the system because all the training sessions, they are really good organized by the athletes. But what about the private reasons? That's most time very spontaneous. The Adams is in its usability and intransparent system where athletes don't know that they could see who gets access to their whereabouts. On each personal side, inside the atoms of the uh, athletes, they know or could see which authorities or which persons know their data. What we can say about the privacy, from a legislative perspective, privacy does not take place in an athlete's life. But from a social perspective, we understand privacy as an individual and flexible concept. In that concept, privacy seems to be possible in a today's doping control system. For example, if you visit places where doping controls can't happen, for example, Kilimanjaro. We found out that athletes feel observed by entering their whereabouts, and for a small percentage, doping controls shouldn't be necessary at all times, like holidays, engagement, and so on. Especially interesting is that the social environment feels affected by doping controls, and the environment don't know that personal data of them could be part of the atoms as well. I think so, at this point, the private life of the environment has to be safe. It can't be that nobody knows of the environment that they are part of the atom as well, because the doping control system didn't ask them before. What about the effects? So the function to protect the values of sports, make sports cleaner and the trust into atoms as a preventer seems not that high, particularly if the athletes are longer part of the atoms instead of younger and newly added athletes face into the system seems to be higher. The user unfriendly interface seems to be the Achilles first, cause Time is one of the most important substrates in that short life of athletes being. But that shouldn't be the argument to implement GPS, wristbands, or chip implements. Privacy could happen. In a high 24 hours, 365 survived sports world, when athletes visit unreached places or if they falsify their whereabouts. So, for the discussion, I give further to my colleague Niels. Okay, just a few. Hi. Um, <clears throat> just a few conclusions from these numbers and what we what we think and what I think is important or we think is important um, that should be mentioned. Um, there are three things. The Adams. Um, we believe, and, and uh, the, the whole study has shown, is creating its own surveillance environment, and this has serious consequences for issues about pri of, of privacy. Second, athletes lack basic knowledge about the system. This is not good. And thirdly, privacy is about contextual integrity, not so much about the individual only. I know most laws about uh, data protection laws are very individualistic laws, but in a sociological context, it's about contextual integrity of information, who I share with and who and what is appropriate. What does that mean? What can we conclude from this? What should we be discussing and think about? And here are some, some thoughts. 
By collecting the data, the Adams becomes a tool not only to monitor what athletes do, but actually who and particularly what they are. Creating an idea of what an athlete should be like by classification and the system, etc., disregards a notion of individuality and neglects the contextual integrity of their personal information and, in fact, their personal lives. The Adams renders everything a person who is listed in the system does into an activity of sports, thus considering it as non-private. There is no such thing as an athlete's private life. It's all about sports, wherever you are, when you have to give an hour a day, when you have to accept out of competition every day on funerals, as happened in Germany, on marriages, six o'clock in the morning, whatever. Against the background of the digital, digitalization or digitization of the world, our everyday and social life at large becomes subject to a particular and focused control within the Adams, and this is highly problematic. Okay? It's not only the Adams, but the Adams is within this digitized environment, which is not alien to, but it's part of. Okay, and the, statistic, the statistical numbers have to be seen in the light of the following, and I think very core issue that we work with. We have to be aware of the fact that the Adams is not merely just a system with athletes as attached users. Athletes are not the users of the Adams. They are the actors within the Adams. And the fact that their knowledge of it is partially limited adds to, to, to the problem. The Adams represents on, in part uh, one part within a techno-social network consisting of database, control procedures, norms based on the water code, normative assumptions about athletes' lives and what it should be like, criminal justice regulations, controllers, administrations, and the athletes as actors within this network. Okay? They're not only the users. Having a limited knowledge of the essential part, the whereabouts system, the atoms, how it works, and who can see my data, everything, in the network is problematic and makes them the weakest part which is a contradiction in terms as the Adams should empower those athletes that are deemed to be clean, whatever the, the, the definition of that might be. And within such a network, and this is very, very uh, important, the, the relations between the, its elements are manifold and dynamic, complex and fussy and often unpredictable. Any assessment must be aware of that notion. Thanks. Thank you, Marcel and Nils. I wonder if uh, your intervention would uh, maybe provoke a few questions or comments from some of the anti-doping establishment people I know who are present in the room will uh, have to wait and see. I sometimes wonder if uh, things are like you describe them here for our Western world, well-educated daily, daily computer users who know how to handle smartphones and computers and applications. How uh, is it functioning for athletes less fortunate in other parts of the world who may not have the same uh, experience and access? Uh, maybe you have some uh, ideas about that. We could come back to that later. First, we have uh, a few more speakers. And uh, the next one is uh, Polina Tomczyk. She represents the European athletes. She's. Uh, also an academic, and she's also a very, very good uh, judo athlete, so there's a one-on-one -on -one that I wouldn't uh, want to challenge anyway. But Paulina, you have been looking into uh, the uh, reporting practices of the national anti-doping agencies and what you found or did not find. You will uh, present to us now, please. Thank you very much. First, I have to... Um Clarify that I'm not an academic, just to make sure that other colleagues who actually are uh, wouldn't be too hard on my research, which is a research made by a policy officer from the perspective of player unions rather than a really academic research, I would say. But um, our, our idea was to make an assessment of monitoring practices of European NADOs. And actually, uh, what we have done, it's a follow-up on a study that have been done by my organization in 2011. Uh, they have assessed reporting practices and the content of reports and have found that, first of all, there were a huge number of reports, more than a half, 
uh, of, the, of the countries involved in the study that were not available. And at the same time, when they were available, there, not all the inf important information was, um, was included in the report. Um, and at the same time, uh, as, as, we, as my, uh, I think, previous speakers has illustrated that perfectly, that anti-doping requires very big sacrifices from athletes, so we should be able to actually have some data to monitor and to check how the, the anti-doping activities are being done. So the accountability and transparency, it requires that the reports are publicly available and at the same time that they are understandable. They are easy to understand for every person to read them and to actually draw some conclusion and that includes athletes. So what we have done is uh, we, we aim to, we included in the study uh, the um, NADOs from the countries of uh, Council of Europe, so it's 47 member states and we also included Belarus because they are uh, supposed to hold uh, a very big event in 2019, the European Games, so we wanted to check where they are with their anti-doping practices. Um, so it's 51 NATOs in, in all. It's because of Belgium, who actually has four NATOs because of its very specific structure. And, and um, the reports that, that we were looking at come, were from 2013, 14, and 15. And we have been gathering them between 2015 and 2017. The, the research phase closed in July this year. And so first on the availability on the reports, as you can see on the screen, um, we included also the number of NADOs with the website because if we talk about publicly publishing the report, publishing it on your website is most obvious, but if another don't have a website, then of course you cannot publish, publish your report then. And then we can see that only 28 um, NATOs from, from Europe has, has made them reports available for all three years included in the study. And if we ask for a version in French or uh, English, it has only been 13. And on the second table, you can see also that Actually, there has been, it, it has not been so um, consistent uh, when it comes to publishing the reports from one year to, to another. Uh, there have some countries that would uh, publish a report in 2013, but then they wouldn't report in 2014, and then they, again they would publish a report in 2015. It was a bit, uh, a bit surprising. And after we have gathered this report, so it was... Um, 97 reports in total. We wanted to assess their content. Um, in, uh, we, we, have, we have actually established a template, a table template for wh where we were looking uh, to put all the different categories that are listed, uh, that are listed on the presentations. And what we have found, unfortunately, were that we were not really able to compare the data that, that we listed in the previous slide. Because as you can see, amongst the 30 reports that were available for 2015, there were only 17 that include a complete information on anti-doping controls. It, it means that the, the total number of tests, out competition tests and in competition tests, uh, blood and uh, urine tests, uh, 21 included the complete information on anti-doping uh, rules violations, and when I say com complete information, again, I mean um, um, it was analytical violations, non-analytical violations, and uh, we would have to go back to that one then. Total, analytical, and non-analytical. Uh, we also wanted to see how many, how many NADOs would include information on registered testing pools in, uh, in, in the report. And again, it is something that is a huge burden on athletes, and we have found it only in eight reports. So it's eight out of 51. And uh, then there were 10 who included a complete information on uh, therapeutic use exemption requested and granted, and 12 included information on athletes' biological passports. So that, that is for, um, for 2015. 
And a very important number that we wanted to look at is also the number of anti-doping rules violations in Europe. So uh, we were able to do that on the basis of 22 reports from 22 NADOs for 2015. And as you can see, for 56,000 of tests conducted, there have been 406 uh, violations reported, which stands for 0.7%. Uh, we have also, um, for, the, for the use of the study, analyzed the WADA report. Um, so as you know, the, the, WADA, the WADA publishes a laboratory report, uh, but since this is something that, uh, that, uh, that reports on adverse analytical findings and ATFs, which do not actually result in a violations, we didn't uh, put that much time to analyzing that but uh, we focused on uh, anti uh, DVR report for 2013, 14, and 15. Um, so you can see the main findings from, from, from this report, and actually it has to be noted also that uh, the fact that WADA has started publishing this report is, is a huge step forward, I think, because before they were not really reporting on actual violations. Um, but what we couldn't find, actually, was the number of uh, tests which were con con conducted out of competition in order to actually assess the um, efficiency of in-competition testing and out-of-competition testing. The only thing you can see here is um, that there have been a lot more of, uh, of uh, violations that resulted from in-competition testing than the ones that result from out-of-competition testing. Um, so to draw some conclusions, uh, there is still a very big number of European NADOs that remain not compliant with, the, with their reporting um, obligations from WADA code. And the, in, in, the, 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 the fact that the reports are often incomplete, and at the same time there are various reporting practices, it really makes it difficult to compare data at the European level. Um, there, ha we have also noticed that, unfortunately, there is an inadequate reporting from Eastern European RADO, which we have contacted. Um, there are seven countries which are a member of this RADO, but uh, the information that we have received from them could not have been classified as the report, so we didn't include them in the end because what they asked from the countries was just the number of tests and number of positives. We didn't, uh, we didn't consider that as report. Uh, we also believe that WADA should, should um, put more emphasis on actually monitoring if the countries are fulfilling their reporting obligations. And, um, and uh, we still believe that the, the, it's the inefficiency of testing has been once again um, confirmed as there is a very relatively small number of violations resulting from a very big uh, number of tests. And also, uh, last but not least point, I think um, it is important to notice that on the WADA website, we have noticed that in cases of seven NADOs, the link or the, uh, yeah, the, the link, the contact information for NADO was not working or was the wrong, wrong uh, yeah, I think it's, it's important as well. Um, and when it comes to, to recommendations, we actually are, repeating all of the, of the recommendation that has been expressed in the report from 2011, we would suggest that there should be a standard, standardized reporting. Uh, it would be possible to develop a template which would include all the important information and the guidelines how to, how to fill it out to be actually able to compare the reports between each other. It should be available in English or in French with an annual deadline for publications and the links should be provided on WADA website. At the same time, we feel like we need more data and more research on the elements of anti-doping, these ones especially that are the most invasive. And I said invasive twice because it's very important, apparently. And, um, uh, and as, as we could have seen, they were often not included in the, in the reports from NADOs. Um, and, and furthermore, when it comes to actually drawing some conclusions from the report, it is very important to, 
to know what we are aiming for. So um, it is important to monitor the prevalence of doping in sport, but in different sports and in different countries as well, to see if we actually are going towards the goal of reducing the prevalence of doping in sport. Okay, I'm sorry to no, exceed no, my time, no, no. and thank you very much. No Thank you very much, Pauline. Maybe uh, Ainada would have some uh, comments later on uh, as to uh, the suggestions from uh, Pauline and the EU athletes uh, as for more standardized uh, reporting by the NATOs, maybe even suggesting a kind of uh, best practices plan for that. We'll hear that later. But first, uh, we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Mark Bonneberger from the Federal Institute of Sports Science in Germany. Uh, participation of athletes in educational programs is, uh, it's, I think, a challenge for most anti-doping organizations. And you have been looking into possible ways of uh, enhancing uh, that. And we'd like to hear from you now, Mark, uh, please. Yeah, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm delighted to be here today and talk to you about my topic, um, participation of athletes by means of digital tools in the context of anti-doping, and how this approach could lead to a more comprehensive doping prevention um, program. Yeah, as I or as, uh, already uh, mentioned, uh, my name is Mark Wonneberger. I'm from the Federal um, Institute of Sports Science. And what I'm presenting here today is a collaborative project between our National Anti-Doping Agency and um, our institute with an active and close involvement of our German Athletes um, Commission. And our objective with our project is to shift the paradigm towards an athlete's perspective uh, when it comes to participation in the context of anti-doping. So that we see, or that we look at the athlete, him or herself, uh, no longer as passive consumer of doping prevention programs, that we look at them um, as giver of ideas, user of innovation, and receiver of knowledge. Our program, um, or our project, launched in 2017, and as I already said, it's a collaboration, and unfortunately, my colleague uh, in this project, or my partner in this colleague from the German um, National Anti-Doping Agency, Dominic Müser, can't be here today. It is um, planned to implement um, these ideas or these participation um, ideas into a mobile smartphone app. And um, these mobile smartphone app um, should be implemented into the already existing doping prevention program, which is hosted by our national anti-doping agency, uh, agency, and it's called Together Against Doping. So this is already existing and it should be implemented into this. Currently, uh, we are interviewing 12 young elite athletes to get information from them how an app such like this uh, look like. So um, what kind of usability is needed? Uh, what kind of designs um, should we focus on? So that is one of the reasons why we are currently interviewing 12 younger elite athletes so that we can provide them with a smartphone app which perfectly um, fits their needs. Um, the final version of this uh, smartphone app um, is expected by 2018, and um, as I already mentioned, um, what you can see is one of the first design um, sets, and we are trying to identify what are the um, design sets um, which fits perfectly to the younger athletes. So we are not right now sure which to choose, but we present some different design sets to them and ask them for that. Before I come to the or before I elaborate a bit more in the detail, what is an EAT participation approach, um, I would like to give you um, some background information about our rationale. First, athletes are key players in sports. I think that's so far so clear. Um, that means that athletes ensure that the competition takes place. And they are also surrounded by different regulation and framework conditions, which means uh, anti-doping codes or anti-doping rules and also different laws um, and so on. And one of the main points is that athletes um, possess specialist knowledge, which is value to integrate into the current uh, doping prevention um, system. So they have very detailed insight into the, into the doping prevention system. And derived from this mentioned um, points, um, it is an legitimate interest of an athlete to let them participate in the realm of doping prevention. But here, 
the challenge uh, begins because it isn't that easy to integrate um, a bigger number of athletes uh, into the current doping prevention system because we have to tackle what I think mainly two issues. Um, the first issue is I call it mobility and time issue. It isn't uh, that easy to, um, to let athletes participate, to train and compete worldwide. So an athlete who trains uh, in a foreign country or competes in a foreign country isn't uh, necessarily available for doping prevention topics, um, only for the reason because he can't be on site. That's the first um, issue we have to tackle. The second issue we have to tackle is, um, I call it a ratio um, issue. That means um, it is not that tricky to identify um, the most popular opinion among 10 athletes, for instance. But it's getting more and more tricky to identify um, the most popular opinions among a bigger number of athletes, for instance, uh, 50, 100, and plus. So these both, to, um, issues has to be um, tackled and recent developments in the technical field um, gives us the chance um, to tackle these um, issues. And what I would like to present you now is um, how we can bring that into action, how can we bring or how we can we tackle these issues with um, modern technological developments. And that's the theoretical background of our app which we are right now are programming. And I want to give you an example of its usage. Um, so let's imagine um, there will be in the future a doping prevention workshop. And um, we will ask um, a crowd of athletes, what are your preferred topics for this doping prevention workshop? So what you can see on the left hand side is each single dot represents an athlete. And the bottom left athlete, the bottom left dot could be a basketball player. The top right could be a table tennis player. They don't know each other necessarily. Um, so, and now you ask the same question to all of these athletes. So my example question is, which topic should be discussed at the doping prevention workshop? And now in a given time, um, every single athlete has the chance to contribute or to state his own opinion or a topic to this, um, to this workshop. And after, uh, given time, you will identify what are the most popular topics among these athletes. For instance, here's a group of 12 who is interested in one certain topic for this workshop. And after a while, you will identify other topics which are also interested, uh, interesting in, um, under these um, crowd of athletes. And this first um, stage only ensures that the most popular, popular um, opinions uh, or topics among these athletes will reach the second stage. And the second stage is the consensus, um, consensus making process um, stage. So in the second step, the most popular opinions among these athletes will reach this step. And now the next step will ensure that um, these identified topics can be um, again discussed under um, the athletes on the left-hand side. So for instance, the group of eight uh, wants to talk about supplements in this uh, workshop. Um, the group of 12 wants to talk about injury and illness. Um, it is now possible from each single dot on the left-hand side, so each single athlete can now contribute um, to these made um, suggestions and adjust them and make um, suggestions um, how to improve them. So for instance, the group of eight, um, it could be, so they want to talk about supplements, and the left-hand side crowd um, could say, um, it's better to add nutrition to the supplements group because then the entire topic is more valuable for, uh, for a greater or for a bigger number uh, of um, athletes. And that is what I mean with consensus making process steps. So it is possible from the left hand side to give input um, to this second stage. And only the most popular um, opinions, the most popular topics, which are consensus based, will reach the final step. And this is this decision making process um, stage. So, uh, and again, Every single dot from the left-hand side, every single um, athlete from the left-hand side can vote now for the most popular topic uh, which is preferred by, by these athletes. And this entire process 
ensures um, eventually um, that the specialist knowledge of each single athlete is involved in this entire process. So the specialist knowledge of every single athlete is available on every um, stage of this process. And it also ensures that the decision making is um, innovative, jointly decided and based on consensus. And to sum it up, the e-participation uh, e approach um, added value for a more comprehensive doping prevention program, and it is a shift towards a, yeah, it's a shift of paradigm towards an athlete's um, perspective. And as I already mentioned, it is uh, independent of uh, mobility and time of an athlete, so um, he doesn't have to be on uh, on site, and it is scalable to a bigger number of um, athletes. And one of the main points I already mentioned is um, it is valuable and um, to integrate um, the athlete's specialist knowledge into the current doping prevention system. And as I also um, um, mentioned, we don't should look at the athletes no more longer as passive consumers. We look at them as a giver of ideas and user of innovation and a receiver of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for this interesting insight into this new way of, of implementing the athletes in, uh, in the education that is so uh, much needed in every anti-doping organization. Uh, we have one final speaker at last, but certainly not least. I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Mike McNamee, who is, uh, I would say, on a global level, one of the most foremost uh, experts on sports and ethics, and he could speak about uh, I suppose dozens and dozens of uh, themes that would be probably uh, relevant uh, today, but uh, he will focus on uh, one special theme that you can see here, uh, the one thing that is actually a very uh, current issue, the pro probable uh, GPS tracking of athletes rather than uh, for the whereabouts uh, system. So, uh, Mike, please. Thanks very much, Jesper, and thanks to Jens uh, for the invitation. Uh, I should say that although I'm speaking to you, uh, the paper uh, which this is the product of is uh, a paper that's been written by the WADA's ethics panel. We don't get to agree about things necessarily 100%, but on this matter we do uh, agree, and all the authors are listed there. I'm Professor of Applied Ethics at Swansea University. Here's our new campus where we work, right next to the, uh, the Atlantic. You're very welcome to join us. That was the last sunny day, about April last year. Um, I'll, I'll go straight into the, uh, the talk without further ado. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit, but you can read behind me if you so wish. Uh, lots of people talk about uh, the whereabouts system as an essential tool in the anti-doping struggle in order to determine where and how to um, identify athletes who you wish to test. There are lots of weaknesses which I'll just discuss, and there are some benefits of that system uh, which I shall present later. Lots of people, including athletes, have suggested the answer to this problem is not uh, form filling or the complex processes of atoms, as the athletes see it, but rather GPS. Use a GPS tracking system to track out exactly where we are, and you can find out uh, who is where and test them. Does this provide more answers than it gives uh, solutions? I think the answer is yes. So does the rest of the ethics panel of WADA. But here's the argument then. So first, we know that in lots of the social sciences of anti-doping uh, literatures, people have identified weaknesses of the system. First, it's uh, excessive salience. Ivan Waddington once remarked that uh, pedophiles aren't monitored regarding their whereabouts as much as elite athletes, which is very provocative, but probably true. Uh, what follows from that is another matter. Uh, we know that, uh, and several of the speakers today have mentioned this uh, notion of the infringement of privacy, although that infringement is not universal. It's clear that in Europe we have uh, Article 8 in the Chapter of Human Rights which says we have a right to a private and family life, and it's not at all clear uh, that uh, the whereabouts system is consistent with that interpretation of the European right. We know it has high costs and we know it has an administrative burden on athletes, although the athletes themselves think of the whereabouts systems, by and large, as a necessary evil. 
Um, so athletes themselves have suggested GPS monitoring as a way of identifying them. Should we listen to those voices, though? Well, I want to go straight to the potential advantages. Well, you could perhaps wear such a device in order to identify an athlete and conduct an out-of-competition test. Or, as some people have mentioned, you could just simply insert a biosensor that could be um, uh, implanted within the body. There's lots of discussion about uh, biosensors at the moment. For example, in the, in the medical world, people are thinking about biosensors to give lifetime tracking of glucose, which would be a fantastic medical innovation for those who suffer from diabetes. Uh, and you could indeed think of such a, uh, an application for uh, lactic acids for football players. When should you or should you not um, take them off the pitch? But we could think of a similar application for anti-doping. We could have a biosensor that was either implanted within the body or worn on the body. Certainly, it would have the advantage of uh, reducing uh, the likelihood or the incidence of missed uh, competition controls. Uh, and finally, uh, we know this thing, which athletes seem to think is a big hassle, and the administrative burden. I really can't see this myself. If, if, if you thought that any other profession had to report where they were being in, in a working day for an hour of their day, I don't think many professions would think of this as an amazing burden. Athletes do, for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me. I'm sure it's a bit of a pain in the backside, but I can't see it as an amazing uh, burden myself. Uh, it would also be tremendously useful in the science of anti-doping to have lifetime monitoring of athletes and to combine it with other data. So if you knew exactly where a person was and you knew exactly what kinds of uh, pharmacological variables you were looking for, um, along with the athlete biological passport, you would get very powerful information indeed. Is that kind of intrusion proportionate with the goals of anti-doping though? That's I think the key question that we need to think about. And uh, in terms of the uh, advantages, we've mentioned it before, but I'll, I'll say it again. It appears to be a potential infringement of athletes' right to privacy. If it were 24-7 monitoring, um, why do we need to know where an athlete is 24-7? I mean, we just need to know where they're going to be for testing. But if you think about getting 24-7 lifetime data, that's going to give you an awful lot of information that you don't need, but that somebody else might be very, very interested in. Does it fit with the principle of proportionality? Well, the, the first thing about proportionality is you have to establish the ends of the intervention. Now, anti-doping is a morally legitimate pursuit. It's an important goal for society and not just sport. But does it interfere unnecessarily with the living of the athlete's life? Now, that's a really interesting question. Because if athletes are going to say en masse that it's not a burden, maybe we should listen to them. Maybe we should listen to them. What we know, though, is that this will bring heightened intrusion. Okay, if you're going to complain that, that this is an infringement of a right to privacy with one hour a day, what's 24-7 going to be? The athletes on the registered testing pool are already exceptions, not the norm. Most athletes do not have to submit uh, uh, anti-doping um, uh, whereabouts information. Let's remember it's only a very small number of athletes. How many people in the athlete pools actually want to do this? I mean, if somebody says it, it was reported in London about two weeks ago, uh, the chair of the World Olympians Association made a remark off the cuff and it was quoted everywhere in the press that this is a, a potential solution to, to whereabouts. And then it gets repeated all the way around the world. But how many athletes actually want to buy into this system? Because if you want legitimacy for your anti-doping uh, system, you must have athlete buy-in. It's not clear to me that there's anything like athlete buy-in for this yet. Um, if we're worried about data security and hacking, and that worry is predicated on information of one hour a day, how much more concerned should we be about 24-7 data? Much more, I suggest. Um, Finally, considering the potential societal impact of such technologies, which are technologies of surveillance. Might this bring even more discredit to the World Anti-Doping Agency, who are always and everywhere fighting an uphill battle? There is also 
this very pragmatic concern. Uh, Jesper, you mentioned should we, should we have whereabouts or GPS monitoring, but of course, that's a false dichotomy. You need to have both, because you need to know where athletes will be in the future, not just where they are now. So, so it can't be a response to the problem of whereabouts, it can only be an addition to the current policy on whereabouts. Moreover, are we so clear that GPS is really uh, as precise as people think it is? And of course, if it was a wearable technology, athletes might lose it or break it deliberately or accidentally. If they wear it inside their body, it might degrade and cause further harms. So the GPS solution is not a strong solution. It would be a potential further tool to whereabouts, but it would not replace whereabouts. Three points in conclusion. First, the use of geolocalization could be useful in a research setting with a goal of understanding the associations between genotype, phenotype, and the environment. So if we add it to athlete biological passport detail, we're really going to reveal some very interesting information about athletes, that's for sure. However, it's not a replacement, it's merely an additional tool. And thirdly, it heightens the risk of privacy invasions or intrusions and uh, heightens the need for data security, making the athlete more vulnerable to data hacking. So uh, the wider ethics panel agree uh, and entirely on a consensus basis that this is not a technology they would propose. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. If you would like to stay uh, and uh, the other speakers would like to, to join Mike at the podium, then we'll get ready for our debate. I hope uh, the audience uh, have prepared some good questions for the panel. And there's already one finger up. I'd like to see more fingers, and then we'll uh, thank you very much. There's already a few, and then we can uh, take it like yesterday, uh, probably uh, clockwise. But if we have the uh, assistance, the first one was here. And, uh, but first, uh, please uh, let me thank the speakers for their uh, interventions. Uh, very, very uh, different and very insightful interventions. Uh, I think we should give them a hand already now, and then we'll pr pass on with the... Uh, Please, uh, thank you very much. Let's give them a hand. Uh, I did I mean, make myself clear? OK, thank you very much. Well, <laughs> a spontaneous applause, and then uh, we, can, uh, we can move on. Uh, first question here, please. Yes, um, hello, Andy Brown from the Sports Integrity Initiative. Um, Mike, I'm sure you know I've, I've done some work on, um, with the Paradise system that operates um, using GPS technology. And I think, I, I wonder if the wider ethics panel has considered how the system actually works. Because, can you hear me all right? That's better. Oh, that's better. Okay. Because um, the Paradise system basically utilizes a wearable GPS to give an athlete's rough location to a doping control officer who only receives the exact location once they're within four kilometers of the athlete itself. Um, and it also features designated privacy areas, such as graveyards, for example, that, and allows athletes to add private areas, okay? And um, they actually argue, it's, it's approved by the um, German data protection authorities as being um, protecting athlete privacy better than the current whereabouts system does. <laughs> so I wondered whether you considered that. Um, the whereabouts system has been hacked by fancy bears, etc. So athletes are concerned that their data is going to end up in the wrong hands. Under this system, it seems to have check safes and fa sorry, fail safe checks and guards against that happening. Um, but there's also a second point I wanted to make. Um, I wanted to make it to Paulina and say thank you very much for the excellent work you're doing on monitoring the requirements under 14.4 to um, you know, report your annual report through the WADA system. Um, I wondered if you'd seen that um, if they'd have been aware of this back in 2008, 2009, and um, 2010, they would have seen that the Russian the WADA would have seen if they'd have looked at this that the Russian anti-doping agency had been manipulating its doping figures. They reported in 2009 exactly 14,500 doping tests, 2010 exactly 15,000, um, and 2011 exactly 20,000 tests. And 2010, the figures are staggering, out of competition, 7,400 tests exactly, in competition, 7,400 tests exactly, um, and EPO tests exactly 1,000 tests. Now, you don't have to be a genius to work out that that's manipulation. So um, um, the work you're doing is really important in identifying when people 
um, well, Nardo's in particular, um, uh, manipulating the figures. So thank you for that. Sorry. Thank you very much. I think uh, I, I didn't understand everything you said, and I think that proves the point that I made m many times in other connections, that there's nothing as easy to understand as a German who speaks uh, good English as a second language, whereas the native speakers might be more <laughs> difficult to understand. Uh, but uh, I hope uh, the, that the, the panel uh, understood uh, the question and who would like to answer first. Hello, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, Irrespective of the success of the new technology, it still fails the legitimacy and the proportionality tests because although it doesn't reveal to the doping control tester until 4K exactly where they are, still the information is there on a system where they are at any stage. And, and that, that greater data capture, that indiscriminate data capture, means it's available to some people. So um, heightening the amount of data captured heightens the, the levels of data security it also heightens system failure, so if it goes wrong and you haven't got a fail-safe like Adams, you have no idea where that person is within the hour. And the second thing is, is that key point, really, that those who propose GPS uh, to replace whereabouts fail to understand that GPS tells you where they are now, not where they're going to be next week. Well, you need to plan, because doping control officers are a finite resource. You need to plan where they go and how they go and to prioritize among those plans, and you can't do that without future information. So even if it were technologically fail-safe, and no technology system is fail-safe, it still wouldn't match those goals. Sorry. Do you agree in the panel, or you want to comment, Marcel? Uh, I disagree, actually, because in Germany we have the Paradise Project uh, from Jonas Plas, a former athlete. That's what I'm talking and about myself. Yeah, and um, it's possible to do that thing, to do flexible controls and um, yeah, I, I don't know why you say it's not possible and uh, it's, it's hard to implement a system like this. It's, it is possible and it's easier for the athletes. Um, yeah, maybe I should uh, introduce myself a bit uh, more in deep because I'm a um, semi-professional um, cyclist since 11 years. So I have my own experience with uh, Adams and uh, anti-doping testing. And uh, from my point of view, it's really time confusing, uh, um, consuming to fill out all these uh, whereabouts systems. And I think you, it takes yeah, more than two hours uh, every single week uh, to fill out all the stuff, especially in a, in a stage race where you change every single day your, uh, your hotel. So you always have to um, update your whereabouts. So it's really time consuming and it would be much more uh, easier just to have some kind of uh, GPS uh, tr um, tracking systems. And uh, in addition, I think um, most of, yeah, of the riders or athletes in our generation just use uh, this kind of smartphones. So we are tracked uh, anyway, so um, it doesn't matter um, if it's uh, tracked by the uh, anti-doping uh, agency um, as well. And um, yeah, so I'm, yeah, I would uh, prefer to use uh, GPS uh, tracking. <laughs> um, uh, in addition to what Marcel said, we have some numbers actually from, the, from that survey. And we asked people GPS, uh, we asked the athletes about GPS uh, tracking, if they, could, um, so if they could turn on and off self-determined the device. And that was about a 54% yes, oh, fully yes, it was six. 35% and uh, combined with uh, one and two with 50% 50, 50 if, if the question is about uh, an implant, chip implant, it falls down to about 26%. Um, I can only say when, I mean, you can do what you want and I don't have to wear this, so because I'm, I'm past any, any age that somebody would want my whereabouts concerning sports, but, um, I think, and, and this I go along with Mike, um, is the, the implications of such a technology um, and, are, are not known. Um, the, the dynamics and, and, and the, the, we'll call it fuzzy logic or whatever is unpredictable and we don't know who else uses it for what purposes. So in, 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 well, I'm not trying to speak for the athletes or on behalf of them or, or instead of them, but I think it is, it is if, if we see how, 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 or how little athletes know about the Adam system and what happens to their data and the data streams, 
It is somewhat dangerous if they, and I can understand why, because of the practicality issues, um, they want a GPS of some sorts, either on a, on a, on a key or, or implant it, well, that seems to be less. But there are implications that most of them, who are not on this podium here, would certainly not understand, and which then has another techn technological and social consequences that are unforeseen. Pauline? I would just uh, like to add uh, some sentences. Uh, um, yeah, I think uh, we accept so many cutbacks uh, in our private life, and I think this is just a very, very small step um, if you think of the whole anti-doping um, uh, process. So I think um, yeah, you just should uh, give uh, the, yeah, the athletes the choice if they want to fill out the uh, whereabouts or just um, yeah, if they want to wear some kind of um, smart device that uh, can be tracked. Yeah. Paulina, and then we take another question from the, yeah. So, um, this opinion about geolocalization devices, it's not really my organization opinion, this is a very new thing and we, we don't really have a stand on that yet, it's just emerged now, but it's my personal opinion, I'm very surprised about people who would, who wouldn't have a problem. Maybe I'll try another one. Yep. I'm not great with technology, yes. But I think if, um, if we are talking about how whereabouts are a burden, we should rather go into the direction, for example, of team whereabouts. If there's a team sport, that should, they should be tested uh, according to whereabouts, which has been provided by the, by the clubs and during the time that actually train and something like that rather than, than uh, geolocalization because as it has been said also the implications are not that well known. But also to, to come back to your remark uh, and thank you for, uh, for thanking me. And uh, um, I actually just, uh, just a remark on Russia. In this report we have, we have noticed that the reports from R Russia were still available on their website but we didn't actually analyze them. Okay, so we, will, we, we can then add that maybe, but we decided that since there have been, a, the, 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 the doping scheme has been proven, we wouldn't actually get, get into that. But on your remark on the very round numbers, I have noticed that in some other countries, also in the reports that I have analyzed, so it's a good point to actually, um, it is important to monitor this kind of things to check if everything is, uh, is okay. Thank you. We take the next question, please. Uh, thank you. Joseph Depensier from INATO. Um, I think the debate about geolocation is really very interesting. Uh, it reminds me of the debate five, six years ago about paperless doping control and the concerns that were voiced then about the security and effectiveness of this uh, paperless doping control. Well, it's now very well established in a number of countries and a number of programs by a number of service providers as being a much more effective and efficient and error-free system of doing doping control. Um, and I think the real point is that in anti-doping, we have to be careful not to be Luddites. We should be finding every way of embracing new technology and not being scared of it. I think anti-doping has already fallen behind the use of many current technologies, and we really have to be catching up and doing much more to embrace it uh, rather than be worried about the potential issues. I think the Paradise Project in Germany is a good one because it is in fact trying to wrestle to the ground a number of the issues that Mike has identified and the Water Ethics Panel has identified and hopefully it will uh, through the research that they're doing and it is a research project uh, give us some certainty and some useful practical answers to those very important issues. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. We take a couple more interventions. The first one was uh, at the back. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael Ask from anti Doping Denmark. Um, I think my question goes mainly to Nilsson Marcel, but to the panel as such. Regarding Adams, um, as someone who um, works with Adams uh, every day, I, I must say that I cannot totally recognize uh, the picture you, uh, if I understood it correctly, that you, you, you try to, to, to uh, 
to show that the, 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 the information in Adams is kind of somehow depicting a, 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 picture, a, a, a whole picture of who a person is. Of course, it's intrusive uh, in its nature because there are personal data there. But as anti-doping organizations, we are also, uh, of course, uh, under strict uh, rules how to handle this information. And if we don't handle this information correctly, we could be, uh, we could be facing um, a, a criminal uh, charge in, uh, in the worst case. So, but my question is actually, um, if we, let's say we also uh, exclude the possibility of, uh, of uh, entering into a GPS-based system, what will you suggest instead of Adams? Because I think you forget the fact that a lot of athletes, I won't say everyone of course, but a lot of athletes is actually in favor of having this system in, not that they like it, but they cannot see any other solution. Because when they are tested, they know that their competitors are also tested. And that is what giving them a certain uh, amount of uh, security that they are actually uh, uh, participating in, in their in the discipline, in the sports discipline on a, on a level playing field. So what will be your suggestion if we don't enter into more modern technologies and we also uh, will have to abandon uh, atoms? Who would like to answer, Marcel? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand that problem, but uh, I think so. The most grounded problem in the anti-doping system is the intransparency between the different anatos around the world. And I think so, this is the hugest gap that the anti-doping organizations and especially the WADA has to close before we can speak about how we can make doping controls more efficiency. And um, mostly we speak about the athletes, but actually we have to start to speak with the athletes. So what Mark Vonneberger uh, was presenting us and what uh, Paulina showed us that for athletes it's so difficult to get the right information for them, to understand the information correct. So we don't speak the same language than the athletes. And that is one main fact, especially from a pedagogic perspective. So we, we have to know the expectations and requirements of the athletes. And then we have to start develop a doping control system with the athletes together not without them, and that's the main fact, and that makes all the whole problems that we are not thinking about the athletes. So we are too, okay, he represents an active athlete here on the podium, but uh, where are the athletes? We are speaking about them, but we are speaking not with them. Just to, I'm sorry, just to add a few sentences. I'm, unfortunately, I do not have an alternative, and I can't tell you what I would envision. Um, I can now say it's not my job. Uh, I could put some more brain into it and maybe come up with some. Um, but I'm interested in, 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 in actually the interdependencies between the athletes as actors within the system and not as the users. As, you know, it's, not, it's not like an, uh, a cigarette machine where I put in and get out of cigarettes. I'm part of that whole process as the athlete in the atom. So, And this is what, what, I'm, what I'm urging to, to look at is the the whole system of what the atoms is, not just the data that is left there, not just the whereabouts, not just what flat and travels and so forth, but the, what, what happens when I give it in what, what, what I have to do to, or, or, or to, uh, as you said, you know, the, the effort that is put in, what that actually has for consequences on my sporting life, etc. So, so is it, is, and this is the perspective that I'm trying to portray here. So this is the interesting thing. And widen the, the perspective on the system itself and not seeing the atoms, the technology, software, app, but even more, and then things become interesting and more unpredictable and more problematic. And I'm not saying because it's just problematic, we have to abandon it, but we have to speak about it because of the inefficiency of controls. Um, how can we rationalize such a system when we, ca when we don't catch anybody anyway? Thanks. We'll take a couple more questions first, Michelle. I, you are, I have, are you on my list? Yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Michelle Verokin, uh, Sporting Integrity. I've got a, a couple of comments that, that turn into questions for almost everyone on the panel. Thank you for um, some very uh, interesting insights. I mean, the one message I take away from this really is that there's a real absence of accurate data. Would you agree? Uh, in which case, how can we make evidence-based, how can we have evidence-based 
evidence-based decision-making uh, in order to create that legitimate and proportionate way of creating any uh, effective system, be it whereabouts or whatever. But what I am frustrated by with the work that I do with the Commonwealth Games Federation is the complete disrespect for athletes outside of the first world. And that, especially when you refer as if everybody's soft on doping because they don't want to embrace so-called mo modern technologies that actually only work in certain parts of the world. It's a disrespect to the majority of athletes taking part in sport. Having said that, I now flip straight away to the PGA Tour and uh, to Daniel, who seemed to talk about, I, I work with professional golf tours, and you, work, you, you mentioned the PGA Tour doped athletes. My understanding is the PGA Tour have never published any results, so I'll be very interested in what you're possibly going to put up on a website, and I would warn you against any legal action by them, uh, because I work with them, and I've never seen the data on doped athletes. But you are right in what you've said about uh, the athletes are individuals, except, of course, a golfer doesn't work on, in isolation, they work in a team. So one of the things that really frustrates me is the inaccuracy of some of the data that's presented as if it's fact. Thank you. Okay, then uh, let me clarify it. Um, um, it didn't say that 30% uh, um, uh, of the uh, golfers uh, used uh, banned drugs. Uh, drugs. Um, we just uh, looked for different um, price money uh, distributions. And um, so we just... Uh, found that uh, it, the, um, the price money distribution of uh, the PGA Tour is very different uh, from the uh, Tour de France, for example. And then we uh, also developed two artificial price money distribution just to show different kinds of price money distributions. And um, afterwards, we just wanted to um, yeah, show the efficiency or the, the, the impact of these different uh, price money dis distributions on, uh, on the doping behavior. I didn't say that or these uh, results didn't, doesn't reflect that 30% uh, uh, of the um, golfers uh, use banned drugs. We just uh, took the price money distribution to show that in um, professional sports the price money distributions are different. It, for me, it's, uh, I think it's uh, easy to understand that uh, or maybe the uh, prevalence rate uh, of doping in the Tour de France is much higher than in the PGA Tour. I totally agree with that, but uh, we just took the price money distribution to have different ones. Is it? I don't, I don't understand what you're saying about the prevalence of doping on the PGA Tour. And, and when you look at, again, it, it, everything is so specific to a sport, and one of the problems we've got in anti-doping is this obsession with one size fits all. Um, for the vast majority of, of, of golf prize money, it actually arises, for example, the race to Dubai, from a combination of uh, achievements across a year. So that's why the prize money features in the way it does. But I, so I think it's really important because you have to have accurate data if you're going to refer to the prevalence of doping on the PGA Tour. Okay, then maybe uh, the, the model doesn't fit the PGA Tour. As I mentioned, we just wanted to show that uh, price money distributions are different. That's all. Um, it it's an estimate based yes. on the price money. It's not what, who, which golfer actually took what pill, but it's an estimate. It's a model. It's a, yes. it's a crystal ball he looked into. It's, it doesn't have to do with real numbers. And the, the aim of the, of the model is not to... Okay. okay we the, the aim of the model is not to uh, predict the real extent of doping. We just want to show how different um, anti-doping measures or price money may affect uh, the doping behavior. That's it. Thank you. I think we take the last two questions, uh, one after the other, and then uh, we'll uh, go back to the panel and let them uh, give their uh, final answers and uh, reflections uh, on, on uh, the topics raised. So we'll not go over time first here and then there, first in the middle. Hi, um, I'm Ian Smith of the Esports Integrity Coalition. Um, I'm a little perplexed that we've spent an hour talking about um, how to track athletes down when listening to Paulina's uh, talk, which 
you know, arises from work done in 2010 which had similar results uh, and, and what I see, unless I'm wrong, is that uh, uh, things haven't really improved, not, not in any meaningful sense. I was part of that study with Walter and the guys in, in the early days. And so we're talking about how to find athletes when the evidence is very clearly that finding them makes absolutely no difference to the, to the efficacy of what we're doing with them when we find them. So we're spending enormous amounts of time and money tracking athletes down, talking about how to track them down, but the end result is we're catching practically no drugs cheats via that process. What on earth is the point? Why don't we spend the same money looking for a better way of finding drugs cheats? While you consider that question, we take the last answer and then uh, we'll take a round uh, across. So please wait, Marcel, and we have the, uh, the question from uh, here and then we'll uh, sum up. Uh, hello, I'm Nikolaos Theodorou from Greece. I'm a project manager of uh, EU project uh, sportwistle.eu. Uh, uh, my question is on privacy and personal data protection. And uh, I wonder if our panelists or uh, NADO representatives or WADA representatives in this room are aware of the new European Union data protection laws. And what does it mean for the sensitive personal data and identity data of EU athletes as citizens, as competitors, and as whistleblowers. That was the final question. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. And uh, we'll uh, go from in the other direction that we started. So, <laughs> Mike, please. Um, uh, I'll respond to Joseph's point, if I may. I think the thrust of, of the paper is not anti-technological. Uh, it's merely to expose the limits of technology. Uh, the future prediction of where athletes will be is essential to doing testing. So you can never get away without some kind of system uh, for identifying and planning and prioritizing who you want to track, when you want to test them, and so forth. Uh, efficiency and fairness uh, are always in tension. For me, um, if you're struggling to justify um, the surveillance burdens that Adams brings, there's no chance whatsoever in ethically justifying GPS monitoring because it gives live capture of data 24-7. And lots of people could be very interested in that data. We know that e even Adams, which is a, you know, a strong system, is open to attack. Uh, therefore, we would need much higher degrees of safety to protect uh, the, the whereabouts data that uh, would be provided by uh, GPS sensors. And uh, the final point is the one to respond to Michelle. That's a really interesting point, that we, we make an assumption that technology is universally applicable, and it's clearly not. And I think that's uh, a good point. As regards to Paulina's point, my very last point, uh, team whereabouts is a disaster, an absolute disaster. I mean, it was used as a system to evade doping controls by lots of sports and lots of people. So uh, if it's not identifiable as an individual, I'm afraid you've got even less chance of catching doping cheats. Sorry, sorry to say. Short remarks from the panel, please, and then, yep. thank you. Um, yeah, first I would like to say that uh, my field of expertise is uh, in participation and doping uh, prevention, and um, that I think doping prevention and uh, participation in this realm um, is uh, needed and that participation is completely voluntary um, to athletes so they can take part but they don't have to and it's an opportunity for them to, um, to, um, yeah, to take part in doping prevention. And um, yeah, from my point of view um, the athletes expertise as I already mentioned in my talk um, is needed into the um, current system into the doping prevention um, system because he has these um, specialist um, knowledge. Thank you. Mm, so just to comment on, on the last, uh, last few questions. Uh, it is true that one of the very important conclusions is that according to our work there have been no significant change. There have been some of the more reports that are available but the trends remain the same. Um, and uh, I agree also, if, if we are even talking about some new measure that are supposed to be introduced, there has to be already a research done to, to establish if that would be effective. Because we have to remember, if we are, if we are doing some restriction of hum human rights, and anti-doping is a restriction of human rights, this measure has to be proportionate. 
and, and need to be effective and need to be actually necessary, the best measure to, to achieve this goal. And, um, and in, uh, when it comes to the comment on general data protection regulation, I think it's, it's a very important one. And also we have, to, uh, we have to make sure that it's the WADA code which is in, in accordance and it's, which complies with EU law and not that the member states uh, will change their legal system in order to comply with WADA code if there have been uh, certain, certain problems which are, have been identified because I think it would be um, inappropriate. And to comment on, on Mike's comment on team whereabouts, as I said, in this, in this study we were not able to actually assess the, the effectiveness of out-of-competition testing, but my colleagues in 2011 did, and I would say that whereabouts generally are a disaster. There is no, it's, it's really, a, there, there was a very low efficiency of out-of-competition testing that has been proven in that study. Yeah, um, actually, to your question, um, then we have to start from the beginning of the doping control system. That would be a history lesson. And uh, actually, I could recommend Marcel Reinhold. Maybe then you got a better understanding of the doping control system and the implementation and why we have still the doping control system. On the other hand, uh, Monica Frenga, it's about economics and sociological uh, of doping. And when you read this, that I can recommend to you, then you get an understanding why we are sitting here and why we are talking about the main facts and the main problems. But when we are speaking about the doping control system, besides we have to talk about the UNESCO as well, because of the convention of the doping, uh, convention against doping in sports, because this is the fundamental basis that we have a doping control system that is working today in our sports world. So. Actually, uh, I, I have to, to start from the beginning, and uh, there would be never uh, an end to give you We have, don't have time for that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, of course, that's the reason why I give further to my colleague. Okay. To the gentleman over there from Greece um, on the EU directive, I can't tell you what happens, but it would be interesting to look into each of those things that you said, and I would take a guess that some of these things, when taken to court, would be falling down. Um, yes, ineffectiveness and why, but we are not here for uh, looking for new systems and we're not upholding the system, but I think if you take all the paradoxes in the anti-doping, you come to, you have to, or you come to a point where you have to ask the morale and morality and the rationale behind being against doping, what is the system, what is doping, uh, what is actually, you know, the is that right what you do? And actually the whole system of sports and doping and controls will be turned upside down. And uh, to the technology, I, say, I think I, I uh, follow Mike in that answer. Yeah, so let me conclude from an athlete's perspective and also from a researcher's uh, perspective. Give the athletes a voice. Start to develop the um, yeah, anti-doping policy together with the athletes and it's very important from, from an uh, athlete's point of view then that you give uh, them choices, for example, using a GPS uh, tracking uh, system. And especially from a researcher's uh, point of view, I would uh, yeah, like to ask and invite you to think uh, out of the box, be open for innovations, because I think yeah, big data and computer simulations can be very, very useful uh, in the future. And so, yeah, that is my recommendation. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I think the most important point is the participation of the athletes. That's the most important thing for all the questions around elite sports. So for me, uh, we have to change our uh, yeah, uh, point of view and um, let the athletes participate. That's the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panel. Another spontaneous applause, please. And then... Uh, And thank you to uh, the, all of you for participating. Uh, I think we really got something to think about whether we are uh, in the anti-doping business, as many of us are, or we are uh, students or scholars or just uh, interested in this matter. So thank you very much to everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.